Hi, Dr. Donna Kinchlow here, and today we're going to review some excellent questions. I was able to create a YouTube on grief, loss, and spirituality, and new nursing students watched that video, and I asked them to submit some questions. 32 wonderful new nursing students gave me 64 very in-depth and very compassionate questions. So this video series is just going to take 10 of these questions and we're going to answer them. I'll answer them, give you some tips, some ideas, some stories that I will share with you and hopefully these sessions will help equip you with actions because I can tell you have a desire to really be good and competent at giving compassionate care to people who are lost or have lost something and are grieving. So let's get started. What do we do if a patient is dying, ask for the chaplain, and he's not available? Maybe he's got a sick day or he's not there. So this is an excellent question. And not every organization that you ever work with has a good team of chaplains. Sometimes it's a skinny team. But you'll find that your chaplains are extremely important people. On my website, you'll find the role of the chaplain. I actually have a handout that you'll be able to access on exactly what the chaplains can do. And the chaplains are a very important spiritual care leader in your organization. But let's go to the question. This person is dying. This person wants a chaplain. What are you going to do? Well, one of the greatest things, if I am the nurse taking care of you and you're asking me for the chaplain, one of the first things I'm going to say is what are you needing? Because if I can identify what the need is, in the event that the chaplain has seen this patient prior to this day, maybe there's something that they've told them Maybe the patient would like to have prayer. Oftentimes, when someone is in the process of dying or death is imminent, our chaplains, where I worked, actually were, were uh, very good about helping families and patients with advanced directives. So depending on where the patient is in the process of dying, that would be one thing. If you're taking care of him or I'm taking care of him, I want to know what his faith tradition is. If a chaplain isn't available and the dear one wants prayer and he is of the Catholic faith and I'm working with a friend who is of the Catholic faith, she may be able to come and meet that need for that man. If that man is of a Christian faith, which I am of a Christian faith and he wants prayer or he wants to talk, I will be there. If he has a home church or a friend that means something, maybe I can call someone for him. The other thing you need to be aware of is in the event that a patient is dying, most people know that. And most hospitals do have things in line, palliative care teams, which are wonderful with nurse practitioners and different ones who can help provide. But the greatest thing is if you can identify exactly what the need is, perhaps you have the ability to meet that need. And if you're the one taking care of them, they've probably grown to love you and trust you. It might be something as simple as sharing a prayer with him or reading something from a, a religious book or the Bible. And if it's something that you can do, it's going to mean a lot because when you are the caregiver of patients and families that are dying, they will grow to love you. As nurses, are we allowed to answer spirituality questions asked by patients if we share the same faith? Or do we have to not say anything and just call the chaplain? No. Uh, I don't know how many of you are aware of the gentleman who was a coach who prayed at the 50-yard line. And 
things happened and he was told he couldn't do it and it went all the way to the Supreme Court. One of the greatest things that happened with that dear coach is the fact that yes, we are allowed, we cannot be censored and yes, as long as we are not pushing our faith upon someone, we can talk about the Lord, we can talk about our faith, especially when you have that mutual sharing, that mutual faith is a part of you. You are a spiritual person as well as your patient. And when you share faith or you talk about the Lord, God, it's an exciting thing when you have that shared mutual connection. It means so much to you and to them. You've got to remember that most organizations in healthcare are holistic, meaning we will care for your body, your mind, and your spirit. And that is the most important thing. And you too have a physical body, a mind, your emotions, and your spirit. And when those are in commonality with that patient, it is extremely uh, memory making. Define the last stage of grief model. Oh, the last stage of the grief model. I'm going to have to get more in depth with a handout for the dear one who's asking this question. The question was actually posed, define the last stage. Well, there was a little more to it. When defining acceptance in the grief model, what kind of acceptance are you referring to? Is it, for example, Acceptance could be a negative scenario. It could be you're accepting the fact you're in a continual cycle of the stages of grief. And that may be normal to them. And so they just accepted that continual cycle. It could also mean you accept what you feel, but you don't accept what happened. It's a very in-depth student's critical thinking. So. Dr. Elizabeth Keebler Ross in 1969 created the grief model and the stages of grief for when someone goes through death. And so for those who do not know about that, that is denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. And it is the last stage of the process. So it refers to embracing the reality that that person is gone, the loss is real it's permanent for example if my husband had died my husband's not coming back it's final it is a difficult stage to reach and it does not mean that the grieving person is functional and living without heartache it actually means I'm getting on the right track and I'm beginning to realize I can move forward at my own individual pace. I might have more hope in life. Maybe even I'm getting my happy back. Acceptance helps with rebuilding life as it is now while still remembering the one you lost. The emotional devastation is a bit more bearable, but it isn't totally completely gone. You, you still understand that loss. And note, this is a very important question. Not everyone is able to achieve the acceptance stage. And some of that is due to traumatic death or murder or unknown and uncertainty and no closure. Uh, oftentimes, when you have the death of a child, it is difficult for the, those who have lost the child or the baby to get to an acceptance stage. It's more difficult. Uh, people who survive major losses you still can obtain a future in life. So acceptance period with hope, the final stage of the model. That's an excellent question. I'm very grateful for it. And it can go 
uh, a little deeper, and I will do that in future videos. When you are in a situation, when you are unable to correct spiritual information until after action is taken, what are you going to do? So uh, this is a, a difficult question to try to say what what is your takeaway what what is what has happened if you're in a situation but you're not sure about their spiritual space or their faith tradition and you've done something wow what are you going to do because you didn't obtain the correct thing i will tell you that one of the greatest things about being a nurse is that we're a little bit like CSI agents and oftentimes your admission history will help you and again when you are caring for people you can simply ask as you're doing your assessment as you're gaining your information as you do every couple of what is it every four hours every eight hours depending on the unit you work on you're going to be doing a, a total head-to-toe -to -toe assessment on these people you're going to be giving them meds you're going to be talking to them and no matter what state they're in or what their diagnosis finding out if spiritual things matter isn't a difficult step there are some hospitals who want you to go ahead and do a spiritual assessment and some of them will have them in their electronic medical records. So when you're talking with the patient, you're going to be able to know, okay, this is where they stand. And there will be some patients that will be very verbal about what their faith beliefs are, and they will tell you. Um, oftentimes, you are so much more as a nurse than you realize. You are the patient's advocate, you are the patient's educator, you are the patient's support system, you are the glue between the doctors, you know what to ask for, you become so important. And in the event that there is some type of mistake, and I, I can give you an example, I, I can give you a little bit of an example. I was caring for this woman and her husband and we just had a wonderful time and I educated them and they had uh, worked all over and uh, I thought they were missionaries. Well, that wasn't the case. They were not people of faith. And at one point, I said something about, well, I'll be happy to pray for you. And this woman looked at me and she said, uh, Donna, we appreciate everything you've taught us. We, we love the care that you've given us. But as far as prayer, we've been all over Asia and all over the world. And we don't have that kind of faith. And I'm thinking, oh, man, I thought you were missionaries. <laughs> So I can understand this. And then when I ask, you know, oh, would you like me to pray for you? Oh, no, we don't believe in prayer. We don't believe in that. We're universalist. We're, we don't believe in any faith. We've seen them all. We just don't adhere to anything. But she made it clear. But we appreciate everything you've taught us and everything. So even though they found out I'm a spiritual Christian, praying person, that didn't negate the nursing care I gave them. And I think that's one of the things that a couple questions actually fit this mold. When you are kind and compassionate and knowledgeable and you inform your patients and your families, no matter what their diagnosis is, they're going to appreciate the living daylights out of you. And so if you do do something wrong, as you might think that that would have been wrong, well, I was assuming because of their travel history and what they were talking to me about, and I assumed wrong. Because you see, not every missionary or 
Peace Corps person is a person of faith. And so I apologized. They were fine with me. And, and you just let it go. And, and it's okay because it's a learning experience. And then you laugh to yourself. You think, oh, golly, you know, whoa. But it's okay because I love educating my my people and they appreciate that. Be that kind of nurse. And anything you do that you think, oh man, I didn't I didn't know. Well, you know, that's human. And I'm oh, sorry, you know, am I not gonna pray for them? Hmm, how would they know? <laughs> How did you deal with your first death of a patient as a nurse? Now, this is a hoot of a question because I started nursing back in the 70s. But when you think about death, one of the things you have to realize is that we all have a history and we have a death or a loss lifeline. And mine was really full before I ever got to nursing school. Now, why would that be? Well, I was raised by my grandparents, and granddaddy had 12 brothers and sisters. And Aunt Miss got hit by a car at the mailbox and died that way. And I think most all of grandpa's brothers and sisters died of massive heart attacks. And... I had been to funerals and I had been to the cemetery and as a kid growing up in high school, what grandpa lost nine, I think it was nine of his siblings and they all lived close. And so I was familiar and acquainted with death. Now I remember my first death as a student nurse, I was in the nursing home and it was different because the man was, we knew he was going to die. He was very old. He was in a catatonic position. I remember this. And he was the first injection I'd ever given. And I can remember calling Grandpa and saying, oh, Grandpa, I'm so excited. I gave my first shot. Today I gave my first shot. He goes, well, how'd the patient take it? And I said, he died two hours later. <laughs> and Grandpa said, you are never give me a shot. So I remember that. But it wasn't hard for me because, again, this nursing home, and we were all prepared that this dear man would die. And then when I did have patients who died, when I graduated nursing school, I went and I worked in a university setting, a university hospital. And it was a 40 bed ward with a trauma unit at the end of the hall. And the deaths that I saw when I was there as a new nurse, there were some bizarre happenings that you will never, you will never encounter. And um, yeah, so I had a patient who died who was on a ventilator and I was the night shift nurse. And I remember having to call the doctor and it was back in the day when you didn't have respiratory therapists do a whole lot of things. And it was night shift and it was me and LPN and nurse aide. It's just the three of us and this patient had died. And here's the crazy thing. The ventilator was in a room with four, there were four patients and this patient was one of four. And I can remember calling, letting the doctor know that the patient had no pulse, had no blood pressure. And of course, the ventilator was giving the patient respirations and the doc said, Donna, I won't be there until the morning. So just leave the ventilator going. Death didn't seem to have the same impact on me as it may you. If you had never seen or been with anyone who had died. And so my first death of a patient as a nurse, they were usually expected. And then I moved from working on the floor to the trauma unit, which uh, we, we saw a lot of amazing things. And a lot of times I'll be the first to tell you, it's a privilege to be with someone when they die. It's a privilege. And I can 
tell you more stories later, but we've got 64 questions, so I'm going to move ahead. But my first death as a patient, just remember this. I'm going to do a course, a little session on loss, because if your dog has died, if your cat died, if you had a grandpa you loved who died, and now you're going into nursing school, you are more acquainted with grief and loss and death in your own right. And what you learn to cope and how you learn to handle and what you believe yourself about death. And as Christian, I believe there's life after death. That is my faith tradition. Yours may be totally different. Maybe some patients and families may be totally different. But I have a lot of peace because of my own concepts and faith belief system. And you're going to find the same with some of your patients and families and your friends and coworkers as well. If you mess up and say something or do something that was wrong when dealing with death, how do you fix it or amend the relationship with your patient? That is very similar to the people that I thought were missionaries and they weren't. And so if I say something that I shouldn't, if I do something, I'll, I'll tell you another story. I had, um, it was early in the morning and I had a young man and the oncologist had come to see him early. And this dear young man had had cancer in the past. And he is sitting in the room in a med surge bed. And the oncologist says to me, Donna, we got to get him upstairs. We got to get him to the oncology unit. His cancer is back and it is in a rage. We've got to get him upstairs. We've got to get his chemo going right now, right now, right now. Okay, okay, okay. So I'm. Uh, he's already, Doc has already been in, he's already seen the mom, he's already seen the a patient who's in his 20s, maybe early 30s, and I'm gathering all of his things, knowing I have to take his bed and get him upstairs, and as I'm flying around, I ask a simple non-threatening question, and this has always worked for me. I said to his mom, who's knitting in the recliner, Miss So-and-so, are you a woman of faith? And she's knitting. Not so much. Not so much. Hmm. Okay. So I say to the patient, as I'm getting his vital signs, getting everything done I need to do for them for the morning and get him upstairs, I say to the patient, Are you a man of faith? And his answer is the same as mom. Not so much. Not so much. And I said, Well, you know. Doc told you that your cancer's back and it's raging and I know you're going to get some chemo and I know you've been through this before and I am a woman of faith and the reason I was asking you all that because if you wanted me to pray for you I would ha happily do that for you and then surprise to me mom puts down her knitting prayer yes prayer oh Yes, I just put him on three of my friends' prayer chains. Prayer, yes, we'll take prayer. And then the young man looks at me and says, I even have a prayer blanket that the last time I had cancer, these people prayed over it and gave me a blanket. Prayer. Prayer was an okay thing. And so I did. Mom got up. We held hands. I said prayers for the son. And as we're driving on out I said this you know prayer and your Christian faithful friends have helped you through your cancer before you might want to shoot up a little prayer yourself and thank God for what he did before and maybe ask him to do the same thing again and so there was no how can I explain it I was more surprised than you can ever know because I didn't expect that response and yet it was needed and accepted and fine and so some of the questions that we have are about what about the non-religious 
Are you a man of faith? Are you a woman of faith? If you ask that question, you're not getting into the little boxes of what denomination you are or what your faith tradition is and the comparisons and the differences. But to have people tell you, not at all, not so much, not so much, and then say, oh, we love prayer. Yeah. And you'll meet all kinds and just be ready. You don't have to worry in the event that we say something wrong. When, when you think about saying something wrong, I'm going to make you a wonderful handout, which is going to give you things that have been hurtful to people who have lost and things that have been helpful. Because you are not alone. Everything that I have read about grief and loss and all these amazing people that give you stories, the most awkward thing is what to say. So I want to help you with that. And, and over time, we will. We will get What's a good rule of thumb for prompting a patient to speak about their culture? Well, when you think about culture, I've taken care of a gentleman who was marvelously fun and family oriented and they were Greek and there was so much love. I am telling you, his, his college age son crawled in bed with him and he was working on his phone and showing him videos and Dad, big dad had his arm around his son. There was just so, so much love there. And I don't know a lot about Greek culture, but I was just enjoying that. And I did. And you can. Ask him. Tell me more about your culture. You guys are so much fun. You really love your family. Tell me about your culture. I don't know a whole lot about the Muslim culture. Can you tell me about some of your traditions or how I can help you better? That's an easy question because the greatest thing is they feel respected when you notice what they are and that they're different. Uh, when it works in uh, when I worked in the heart unit, we would take care of people after open heart. And there were some people who were Indian. And I am telling you, if you know anything about people from India, they love different spices. They love different flavors. American cooking from the hospital kitchen or cafeteria is not going to cut it. So the cardiovascular surgeon came in and said, you know what? bring him whatever food you want to at home. It's better that he eats than he doesn't. And so, yeah, we're exposed to a lot of different cultures. Good rule of thumb, my friend. Ask them. And most people will love to share. They'll show, show their stories, their traditions, and it'll It'll stay in your memory because if a true patient is telling you, they feel good that you care enough to ask. That's a, a wonderful question. What is a sensitive way to introduce information about a recently deceased patient to a grieving relative? Okay. When grandma died, my mother had spent the day with her in Pennsylvania in the hospital. She had driven two and a half hours or whatever, spent the day with her, had lunch with her. They watched and looked at magazines. They just had a very wonderful day. And mom drove home. And that night she received a phone call because some of this is about telephone calls, again, communication. And a nurse uh, was on the other end and said, are you the daughter of Dot? And mom said, yeah. And the nurse said, well, I'm calling to let you know your mother's gone to sleep and she won't be waking up again. And 
for my pretty much non-faith mom, that was the sweetest thing that could be said. To this day, she loves the fact that that's how she was told that grandma was dead. I can tell you an insensitive way to introduce something about somebody that's died. I received a phone call and grandpa had been rushed to the emergency room. And one of grandmother's acquaintance and friends, Jane, called and said, who is this? <laughs> I said, well, this is Donna, uh, Merv's granddaughter. Well, your granddad's dead. Okay, now there's two contrasting ways of telling somebody, your granddad is dead. Okay, how's the sensitive way to introduce information? You want to talk to the person on the other end of the phone if you're on the telephone. Find out who you're talking to. Find out if it's a good time to talk. Uh, let them know who you are. Introduce yourself and let them know. Years ago, we didn't tell people, especially if they had to drive for hours. You know, we didn't want them to get in a wreck because they'd be grieving and they'd be upset. So there, there's different ways and thoughts that uh, some people feel about telling someone, but sometimes it's better to know. Sometimes it's better to know. So you say it as kindly as you can. Uh, if it's someone that you've established a relationship with, you can simply say, I am so sorry to have to tell you but your mom has passed, your mom has passed away, your mom has died. You know, every generation is different as far as how you, you phrase this, but to let someone know your, your mother has taken a turn for the worst, we did everything in our power and we weren't able to save her and your mother has died, and I am so sorry. To be kind, compassionate, and honest has to be the most important thing. Do you have someone with you? Do you have someone I can call to help you? And if you have to share this in a consultation room with someone, the greatest thing is being who you are and knowing that you're also there to help meet their needs. You have to be careful if you're doing this face to face. It's a nicer thing if they sit down. Why? People can get weak in the knees and just collapse and people can fall and hit their head and they have to go to ER. That is not a good scenario. So a sensitive way to introduce to a grieving relative is in all honesty, kindness, and compassion, and also with total awareness of the environment. You don't want to be telling this at the nurse's station when you've got reports going on, or you want to be in a right place, in a right place, with the right people. And sometimes it's more than just you. You know, if you have time to connect with palliative care, nurse practitioner, the physician, uh, a friend that's close to them, whatever. Um, yeah, sensitive way. I think the greatest thing about that question is, yeah, we have to have a sensitivity antenna. And we have to realize, you know, we can't let these grieving people grieve on their own. We have to be there to help them. They need water, they need lunch, they need to eat. You know, we, we need to be there. We need to be there for them in every sense of the way. How would you deal with a patient who doesn't want any spiritual advice or help when diagnosed with something terminal? In the acute care environment, and you have someone who's just found out 
that they're going to die. That's a totally different scenario than someone who's been living with cancer for two years and now it's back. How do you deal with a patient who doesn't want spiritual advice and they're diagnosed with something terminal? One of the things that you have to understand is there is a whole new group of people. When you would do a religious, uh, let's say a survey, let's say you do a demographic survey, you'll see those in your nursing journals where they say, okay, this is your, this is your money, this is your lifestyle, this is your education, this is your spiritual background. You think about it like a demographics, right? Your, your age, uh, 30 to 40, 50 to whatever. You get my idea. So what do you do if they don't want any advice? Well, they probably don't want any advice when they're first learning because there's always a shock that comes with it. You remember the grief, the denial, the anger, the bargaining, all those stages of grief, you've just been told you got an end point in your life now. You're going to die. Spiritual advice, depending on the person, depending on their faith belief system. And if they have none, and that's a point you need to be aware of. There is a group, you could say, of nuns, and I'm not talking Catholic nuns, I'm talking N-O-N-E-S. I have none, no religious faith, no faith tradition, no hope for eternity, no hope of heaven. I don't believe in hell. I don't believe in any of it. God, nothing. There are atheists, there are agnostics, there are humanists, there are people who classify as nuns. They don't want any part of anything spiritual. So, how do you deal with that? Your questioning changes from a spiritual assessment piece to something of meaning and purpose in life. Because even people who claim atheism and agnostic, I don't believe there is a God, I don't believe in God, there is a God but he doesn't care. These different categories of people, they still have things that matter in their life. And that's where you go. What gives you hope? What gives you peace in life? Your grandkids? your adult children, oh, you're woodworking, oh, you're, and you have to go where they actually are. You have to meet them where they are. And I'll be the first to tell you that even though there are people who are non-religious, atheists, agnostics, nuns, humanists, believing in themselves, if they're faced with death, Sometimes they lean on your faith. And some of these people will ask you, what do you believe? What do you believe about heaven? What do you believe about hell? And some of them are really like academic interrogators. So it's a really good thing for you to know where you stand in loss and grief and spirituality. And we'll go over that. What are some things you can do so you don't take the family's grief home into your personal life? Well, there's always HIPAA. We're not allowed and not supposed to be talking about things that we deal with at work because of the private intimate part of being a nurse. So what do you do not to take the family's grief home or situations that have happened. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but there's something called critical incident stress management debriefing. And if you have a coworker or a friend that you can talk to about whatever transpired, because I will be honest with you, you never actually have someone who's dying or you have an emergency where someone is 
maybe a code blue situation, a rapid response situation, that you're not there with your team. And sometimes you have your meltdown moment in the break room at lunch with your friend. Maybe you have a journal that you keep at home and that when you get up in the morning, maybe you journal. I have that habit. I have journaled my prayers for my life and for my patients. I have journaled memories, things that I think about afterwards. Journaling is really a wonderful way for you not to carry it home, but when you are home in your moments where you have some private time, just you, you can go ahead and talk to God about it or talk to yourself. You know, write a letter to yourself. Here's what happened. Here's how I felt. Here's what I thought. I wish this would have been different. Greatest thing is most every healthcare organization does have a free consultation that is private, that is intimate, that is anonymous. So if you ever feel overwhelmed, you do have people to go to. During COVID, our spiritual care team were wonderful. They did some things and they were able to help. And you'll have, when you are working, if you work in the acute care environment or even in a smaller office, there will be people that will help you through any situation. Taking it home, sometimes you can't help but take it home. Sometimes if it's a traumatic event, everybody in the community is going to know about it. Um, and sometimes when the grief is actually the healthcare teams, you will take it home. And hopefully your family will be supportive to you. It's not something you're going to be doing all the time. Uh, for instance, we had a coworker who died and was a single parent, had a wonderful little boy, and we all loved her. And when we found out that she had come into our ER and she had died and she was young, we all were crying. Uh, there's just no stopping it. We were all crying. We were hugging each other, people that you never thought would grab you and say, oh man, they haven't told you that I really love you. I love working with you. I mean, things just were pouring out. Uh, the more you do that at work, the better it is for home because you see you have a family when you are a nurse you have a sisterhood and you have a lot of resources for yourself and you are no different than anybody else if there are grief resources and lost resources you've got to access them and sometimes we're not really good at understanding our own needs but that is a need and there would be someone who you could talk to always Always have that buddy, that buddy system. I couldn't have worked 44 years without my friends. So in summary, this set of 10 questions, if you tried to make them in themes, and I tried to do that. However, I know that when you submitted your questions, two questions came from the same person, so I didn't want to divide them up. So instead of having constant themes, I just went ahead and kept them two questions, two questions, and, and, and I'll do that for the rest of them. So this set actually helped you understand you do have permission to provide spiritual care. And I will tell you it's an expectation from the American Nurse Association. If you work for a magnet institution, it is spiritual care is part of the vision and the mission statement of anybody that you work for. I'm going to take care of your communities, body, mind, and spirit. We will care for you, your physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual needs. Check it out. It's there, and it's an expectation, and most of your organizations are not told how to do it, but because you are a nurse, you are more than permitted. You are not only allowed, but you are also expected, but no one's going to tell you how to do it. So the fact that you want to know just really thrills me. And if I can help you in any way, you know I will. The grief stage of acceptance, again, there's a lot more to acceptance, and I will do a session, I believe, on that all alone. 
you guys, um, you men, young men and women are looking for compassionate communication. That is a video that needs to go broad and probably general because you are not alone. People don't know the right words to say, and there are phrases, there are things that are hurtful, and I will share those with you in uh, another session. Caring for the non-religious, the non-religious and the religious are there. Can you care about one another, even though I may be Christian and you hate Christians? Yeah, you can. Why? Because you're also going to take care of my physical needs. You're also going to accept who I am, and I'll accept who you are. Nursing is one of the most non-judgmental professions we have. You are going to take care of the person, that total person, body, mind, and spirit. And even if it's different than you, their body might be different than you. Their eating habits might be different than you. And just because of that, you're not going to have some kind of a chip on your shoulder. And you might even find that some of these people that you thought were horrible people because of their faith and belief system aren't horrible at all. Caregiver grief coping skills for a healthy home life, very, very important. So those are things that we've gone over. And I thank you so much for your time, and I will get with you for the next session. So have a wonderful day, and until next time, I'm Dr. Donna Kinslow. You can contact me, walkthehalls.com, and it's a blessing to know you.